Can everybody hear me okay? I'm just conscious it's really quite distracting for me to hear the other, um, possibly better what you're hearing actually in the other forums, but um, I hope at the end you, you feel it's being helpful. Um, first thing I suppose Kim and I would both say is, is we're just going to share our, our story, uh, not in any way to say that it's the right way or the right thing to do, but just literally the story that we've had over the last four to five years and some of our genuine learning points that's worked for us in Lancashire. I suppose the context, Lancashire, I think is a great place to live and work. It's a large county council. We have a budget, non excluding non-school, of about 750 million. Uh, 12 districts that we work with, two of those are sissies. Six CCGs, about four acute hospital trusts and two big community trusts. So it, it's, quite a, um, it's quite an interesting place to be. And just to put a little context on it, and over the next four years we'll be charged with taking 300 million out of that 750 million budget. So there's never been a better time to really look at how we maintain the integrity of personalisation, but actually all move to a very different place in terms of the commissioning process. And that's where I'd like to start with our journey. Because about five years ago, when we started to uh, look at um, provider engagement, we just had a restructure, we'd moved into a, a commissioning function. The first kind of six months were just absolutely bogged down in conversations about money and contracts. And we just felt we just weren't making progress on the important area around people and citizens just having a good life. And looking at what, what we could do together just to make that the, the kind of um, the experience for all, all citizens in, in supported services. So the first thing we started to look at was this idea of a commissioning and provider split. And again, this may be controversial, but what I would passionately suggest to you is that the days of a commission and provider split have gone. And certainly in Lancashire, I would suggest there's no place for it. And if what we need to look at is how we see commissioning as a process. And the ownership in that process is the given of the whole community, including the marketplace, citizens, and of course, all partners. Now, what that needs is some real skill and tenacity to drive that culture and agenda. And look at how then colleagues who have specific functions or responsibilities within a community, you kind of wrap that around that commissioning process. So that was the first thing we started to look at. We also wanted to create a, a, a more trusting relationship because again in Lancashire we work with over a thousand providers and whilst we think we've made some real progress, we knew that there was a lot of mistrust and we all had fantasies about what we all thought about each other. So there's something about dispelling those and actually just getting to a place where we could say, look, our universal good here, the thing we're all passionate about, is delivering fabulous services for people. So, you know, let's, let's take the tin hats off and just get into that place together. And that kind of was the context that we set for the four years' work that we'll briefly share with you. We, we felt we needed to be really clear and sharp about our commissioning intentions. And we really needed to make, make it clear the interdependency across a much the, the wider population. So again, 97% of our budget on 3% of the population, that just won't work anymore. It didn't work four years ago. So there was something about in those early days of really looking at where the connections were in well-being and prevention, and just how we started to maximize universal offers and low-level support. And for, for providers to see the fabulous opportunity to link into those as well. And particularly those perhaps in congregated living, whether that be in registered residential homes or in supported living, the opportunity to connect people with their local communities, as well as the naturally occurring things that were important, but also for formal support as well. So there was something about setting up a series of workshops planned over a 12-month period. We were very honest about what we could and what we couldn't do. We set some uh, co-produced ground rules and we were really clear about the conversations that were a bit of a cul-de-sac. So, you know, the money situation, uh, we just had to be really clear how far we could go and agree at times to disagree on that. What we did as well is shape the portfolios of the team that Kim and I kind of uh, support. So that again, we were really clear about lines of communication. So after the forums, there was opportunities for dialogue to check out 
you know, some of the pieces of work that we were engaging in, particularly when we were asking for volunteers almost on a monthly basis to try new ways of working and new things. And, of course, the big thing, and Kim's going to talk far more about some of the practical things, and the thing that excited me the most that was Kim's idea was how we celebrated the success because so much time was spent about what not was working well. And we felt there were some fantastic things that we needed to celebrate. And so that um, what evolved into uh, a yearly event of um, Central Lancashire Has Talent. Uh, and it was the most amazing event. We've done it twice, and Kim may just talk a bit more about that. So I'd like to move on now to some of the very practical things that we've actually done and what the impact's been, and perhaps where we see uh, the next four years. Uh, and I'm just going to hand over to my colleague, Kim, to take us through those. Hello. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, as Terry said, I'm Kim Howarth. I'm the Area Commission Manager in Central Lancashire. And just wanted to share with you a couple of the pieces of work that we've done. We've done quite a lot, and it was hard trying to choose just two of them to actually share some of, of what we've done. The first one that I chose was around end of life. And I suppose we're passionate in the team, especially Kate, our colleague, who's got the portfolio for end of life, that everybody who we come into contact with where we can influence has a good death and it was really important for us to make sure that we were working really collaboratively with providers around supporting people to to have a good death at the end of the, at the end of their life so in terms of linking that with the commissioning intentions we looked at things that were a much wider context so where we were working around the Lancashire and Cumbria network we were also looking at um, what the drivers were nationally around this and where we could translate them into some local commissioning intentions. We were really clear that we wanted to, I suppose really, um, really highlight and, and um, make good the profile of, of end of life really. So we decided to use the Dying Matters Week um, as, a, as, a, as a place where we could do that with providers. So we worked very closely with uh, our colleagues from the hospice and did um, a week of activities with our providers around dying matters. And what that culminated in was a visioning event where we worked with uh, family members, where we worked with people who use services and support, and of course providers to actually put together a visioning event and a shared action plan. What we also did as well was to actually develop a tool which hopefully some of you may have seen which is called living well um, and what we did we worked with a number of providers within lancashire uh, and family members and developed um, a living well um, we called it living well and planning for the end of your life and basically it was it's um i suppose really it's um, a selection a menu of person-centered uh, tools uh, that people can use to start having what can sometimes be a really awkward conversation about people coming towards the end of their life. And it's really helped sort of start that conversation with people. And we've used it within a lot of the um, homes, that the, the residential care homes, and particularly within domiciliary care to start working with that. We also did a, a big piece of promotion with Lancashire Pharmaceutical Committee, which is in which we did a piece for within their actual um, one of the newsletters, so that that as well sits within some of the local pharmacies within uh, within Lancashire, so that people can start having that conversation, and that was done very much with our providers and with with family members. We also run as part of our Good Life for All campaign, which I'll come on to explain what that is in a, in a while, is we ran workshops around living well. So it was one of the things that we wanted providers to really come and embrace and, and join in with. And what we've done, and this might sound slightly punitive, it's not meant to be, but we had quite a serious safeguarding alert um, quite recently, actually, and it was around end of life, and it was actually a provider who hadn't engaged with us, really, around 
provided forums and particularly around our Good Life for All campaign. So what we did in part, as part of the action plan uh, for that safeguarding alert is we actually put in that the provider would actually come along to the forums but importantly join in the Good Life for All campaigns so that they could be part of the Living Well. So hopefully that would help them going forward to really promote better practice. So one, one of the other examples I've used as well, which is around um, a contract that we have with one of our voluntary community faith sector providers um, around promoting independence, and it's around provo providing low-level supports. And for me, it's really, really important to work with providers to really check out with them about what works and what doesn't work. And I suppose both, both Terry and I, um, in the past and, and even now, uh, I suppose get accused sometimes of, of working too closely with providers and I don't think you can work too closely with providers because it's the only way that we're going to make sure that people have as good a life as they can possibly get. And what we wanted to do was work with the providers to actually check out some thinking that we had around a low-level prevention service that works more closely with our aims around some work we're doing around the long-term conditions quip. So what, what I did was met up with the providers, actually spoke to them, explained to them about what, what we were thinking of and what that sounded like to them, because it's really important to me to get that feedback. And what we did, we collaboratively redesigned that, that contract, that specification, and we managed to sort of test it out before it went to full tender stage, to test it out, to really check that it did work before we, I suppose, committed ourselves and what we've got now is a fabulous piece of work that we're, that we're really massively committed to, but that the providers have, got such a, have had such a big influence in making that work. So that's just, that's just one of the other examples. I think the initiatives that have helped um, in terms of how we've, we've sort of built this relationship with providers is we do have our monthly provider forums. So we meet together with providers, we get really good attendance, we have um, guest speakers on, and that will be dictated generally by providers where they're saying that they want a certain, certain input from people. We do things like training needs analysis with the providers to, so that we can then reflect that within some of our other initiatives, which I'll, I'll come on to, to talk about. We also send out what we call our tip bits. So one of our, one of our team produces tip bits, so it can be anything around long-term conditions quip, it could be about dementia, it could be about stroke, and we make sure that our, our providers have access to that information as well. Any notes, any workshops, anything that we think will be helpful to providers, we send out on a regular basis. We also have monthly surgeries with providers as well. So as Terry said earlier, if a provider wants to come and chat with us about something, if they're thinking about maybe uh, redesigning what they're doing or maybe looking at expansion or anything like that, providers know that they can book quality time so that we can talk that through. We've also got campaigns like Good Life for All. Now, the Good Life for All campaign I have to say, is has, has really helped us move forward. And we do things like um, one-page profile tr support. We do hospital passports, tissue viability. So we work with a group of other um, staff, some from, from health, uh, to help us run the sessions. The sessions are free of charge. Uh, we do get really good attendance at them. Uh, we do things like living well, but it's just so that providers can have like a toolbox really of, of workshops and provision that they can just dip in and out of as, as they see fit. We also will do specific pieces of work where we'll put out through the provider forum that we'd like people to work with us. So there can be things like, recently we've done some work with Helen who's speaking next um, around progress for another branch of progress for providers. And we will work really collaboratively with providers around that. We've also just launched a new campaign, which is called Is It Good Enough For My Loved One? Because I suppose 
The bottom line is we only really want to commission services that we would feel comfortable either using ourselves or if our family members needed to use them, that we would feel confident that they were going to get good support. So we've launched a campaign called Is It Good Enough For My Loved One? which really goes into um, detail around person-centred planning. It's around hospital passports so it's some duplication of what we've got in our good life for all but at the end of it there's like a series of workshops that those providers will have done where they can get the certificate we're also working closely with the ccgs so that we can do work with the ccgs as well around how we can present um I suppose really workshops that will help the CCGs in terms of how they want to go around and do business. So particularly some of the work around residential care um, and how we can support providers for residential care um, to be able to support people around end of life, but just things around medication, that type of thing. So we've got a programme that we're starting with the CCGs shortly. As Terry said, we also do uh, Central, Central Lancashire's Got Talent, and it is one of the highlights now of, of our year. We, um, we want providers to showcase, really, what they've done, maybe around personalisation, around innovation. So we have about 10, well, we have 10 awards that we give out, and we also give out, award, this time we had to give out awards, not just for the winner, but for, for an highly commended award as well, because the stuff that we got back that providers were doing were absolutely fantastic. So providers get um, a certificate about that. It all helps as well in terms of, promoting their services because some of them went to the local press and then explained that they'd, they'd won uh, an, an award. They, so they also get them framed, they're put in the, in the front of their offices or services. So they're just, it's just that thing where we can sit back and really reflect on the fantastic stuff that providers are doing because I think providers sometimes get a bit of uh, you know, bad press and, and we don't want to see that in central Lancashire. Um, we, also, we also set up, which sadly is actually going now, but we set up a dedicated section for providers on the local government uh, knowledge hub, which was a way as well that we could use it to, to get more dialogue with providers. Uh, but sadly, that is going. I suppose the difference for us, what we hope we do, is we walk the walk with providers. So each member of our team has a one-page profile and that those are widely shared so people can have access to our one page profiles they can see what's important to us what how to get how to how best to support us i think it's really important that when we're talking to people about one page profiles that we actually are leading from the front on it as well and that if we're asking other people to do it then it's only right that we do it ourselves and I think what we're, what we're looking at with providers is not only that people who they support have one-page profiles, but the, their staff teams as well have one-page profiles. Because for me, if I were having home care, I'd find it quite scary if somebody were coming new into my house who I didn't know who they were. Whereas if you can share the one-page profile, you can see the picture of them beforehand. So it's just those things that we're trying to promote and, and we're trying to instill that by, by, I suppose, really leading by example. As team, as a team, we have uh, person-centred supervision, we have person-centred appraisals. We've, we think, we hope, uh, that we're visible and that we will provide practical support to people. So for me, sometimes the easy bit can actually be actually awarding the tender. For me, it's about the implementation of that new piece of work. It's about making sure that we walk hand in hand with those providers to make sure that we both understand what we're doing and that we actually help each other get over the glitches of implementing something new. So for me, it's not about just awarding the tender and then walking away. It's about actually making sure that we can we can be solution focused, that we can share how we do problem solving. It's that type of thing. 
Another aspect that's really important to me and that Terry and I really make sure that the team do is we look at where we can shadow providers. So if we're looking at a new piece of work or if, say, for example, the promoting independence piece of work, one of the things that were really important for me to understand was obviously to listen to the providers, but to actually go out on the job and just see firsthand what was going on. And that's one thing that we do, and we'll do that routinely, to go out to work with providers, to listen to what people who are receiving services and supports have to say, what they think about what might, what might make that service and support better. And I think one of the really important tasks as well for us is to really understand what those challenges are that providers are, are actually facing. What we also do, we, we use routinely as well we use working together for change uh, which is a, a really great tool in terms of looking at how we co-produce so for any piece of work that we're doing we'll always look at working together for change as a, as a vehicle to help that so that we can really listen to what people think we want to know what works what doesn't work and what, what, would the thing, what would need to happen to make that the best it could be. So those are just some of the things that we do. So I hope we've tried to explain in, in the time that we've got about how we are working collaboratively with providers to really promote person-centred supports. Okay. questions here. You've both got to stand up there. Uh, right, uh, questions. If you've got a question to ask, please stick your hand in the air and I can see a pink jumper. Please tell us who you are and where you're from. I'm Zoe Garbett from um, London Borough of Barclay and Dagenham. I'm in the commissioning team. I was interested in what you were saying about working with the CCGs and I just wondered if you could explain a bit more about how you develop that relationship with the health services and how that's helped the providers and their engagement with the providers. Okay. Um, I think it's with the CCGs where we're, Terry and I work with two CCGs within Central Lancashire and we have been lucky to be able to have some dialogue and I think one of the things that um, had occurred to me was I suppose really a way in really to try and influence the work that the CCGs would do in the future and it was through some of the work we were doing around ur urgent care um, and it was around um, trying to reduce the number of admissions to A&E and there was some discussion about care homes and I thought it'd be really good if we could do a joint program, a joint training support program with the CCGs that would really support providers to look at how they could avoid people just um, going up to A&E rather, you know, so if like ringing 999 so that's a piece of work that I've been working with the GPs down in West Lancashire about and we've put together a programme so it, it's things like um, just sim well they sound simple things but just about working with providers to say if you're going to ring the GP this is the sort of information that the GP would find really helpful uh, looking at how the the best way to do the Mars charts and things like that so that's a program that we're starting within the next couple of months so we've done a lot of work at, at actually um, scoping out what that would look like so that I think sometimes it's just trying to be opportune about getting in and thinking ha huh, we could probably do something collaboratively there then we've got the CCGs working with us I'd like to ask a supplementary about that because I was chairing the home care stream yesterday and we heard from Empower we had some very interesting statistics about GPs not understanding what social care services do so are you finding this an opportunity to educate mm. your CCGs to some yeah. extent as well? Yeah. Go I, think, I think it is. Could I just say we, we've spent many months in strategic meetings trying to agree six or seven priorities, bring our strategic plans together. That's great. That has to happen. But as Kim said, where you get the real buy-in and education is look for the hooks. So the works Kim, Kim has described are great. And we've done some pilots with specific GP surgeries have shown an interest in the work around local area coordination, long-term conditions. And we found the best way is once they see the benefits of that social care offer, and by social care, I mean the wider VCFS, uh, community asset-based approaches, the, the whole actually very limited formal social care, once they see the benefits of that and how it impacts, as Kim said, on their kind of world, then 
that, 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 that's, that's when we found the tipping points happened. And, and we've come in two years from two or three pilots to now a formal program of work around long-term conditions, local area coordination, with a 1.8 million investment from health. So, so nibbling away leads to getting actually the big chunk of cheese. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Have I got in the act? Uh, there's uh, a lady at the front here, and I think I also saw a hand at the back, so we'll come to you next. Good morning. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Just building on what you were selling, I just came across something that's happening in my local council. I come from Southwark Council. They have, they're now piloting and they've spoken to a group of us about a program called Champion, where they select a few of us. And, and the program is initially towards diabetic care. Right. And so they select a few of us and they're going to train us on what what, where, why kind of thing, so that we are out there in the community, able to detect things early. Uh -huh. The, um, how do you put it? I didn't want to say customers, but whoever is living in Sadak, they feel more comfortable that there is a bigger group out there. Now, this is towards diabetes, but I'm sure it can be rolled out in other subspecialties of medicine, especially care of the elderly. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you, and that was a very interesting talk. Thank you. I think that really says itself, really. And there was, a, I think, someone at the back. Yes. Sorry, you were kind of hidden, so I can only just see you. Thank you. Um, my name is Rebecca Matthews. I work for the Department of Health um, in the north of England. Um, I just wanted to ask you about one of the challenges for commissioners in terms of personalisation is your role in actually sort of facilitating the market. Um, I'm, I, I'm interested in any work you've done, particularly in terms of um, very small enterprises or um, uh, user-led kind of ser services um, for micro enterprises, that sort of thing, because often people are looking at very sort of local, quite small scale services to meet their needs. I think oh, we'd love about 20 minutes on that one because it's a, it's a great question. We're, our journey in Lancashire, I'll be really brief, conscious of time. Uh, we, we have worked very closely with the voluntary and community faith sector and use-led organisations. So a good example, we've actually commissioned uh, community brokerage, so we've shifted activity away from formal social workers in, in, into a consortium arrangement of use-led organisations and voluntary community faith sector to deliver specific aspects of the personal budget pathway. So support planning, supporting direct payments and the HR uh, support as well. We've also, as Kim has said, started to think with CCG colleagues about how we use some of our investment much more uh, strategically with the voluntary community faith sector around areas of the pathway that really make sense to shift us to a much more preventative agenda and the crisis light service Kim describes an example now around the market the total market management and there'll be a new juicy in the care uh, health and, sorry the social care bill coming out next um, care and support bill that should come out next spring is it puts a new juicy on the local authority now we're, we're kind of torn because what we'll see we're, we're now 80 percent of new customers have a personal budget. Now, what we're looking at is how we encourage people to take a direct payment. And in essence, how they then have a free choice from what could be an open market PAs. Where we see people saying, no, they don't want a direct payment, we will have a duty to, to arrange that support. Therefore, we'll need a contractual relationship. And the raging debate for us at the moment is, do we shift to a place of a much smaller marketplace for that end of the business that enables us to federate, push up quality, get those providers working collaboratively, but reduce choice? Or do we go the other way and have fairly open market and allow the customer to make choice? Now, the feedback we've had from people in Lancashire is they would advocate reducing the number of providers for that pathway because what they're interested in isn't so much the choice at that point, but getting the good life and the regular support at the time they need and the things they need later on. And we haven't made a decision on that, but that, that's the, our current thinking and, and, and we're just developing our market to position statement as we speak. I'm sorry if I've waffled a bit on, on the question there. I, I'll feed back that maybe next year we need a whole session on that. <laughs> um, right, we have time for one final question, if there is one. Or is it that point where you're all desperate for a cup of coffee? 
I suspect we were on the coffee break. Okay, thank you very much, you. Uh, Terry and Kim. That was great. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we start back in here at 11. We start back in here at 11. We start back in here at 11. We start back in here at 11.